Hello. Hello. How's it going? We need to know who you are. You need your little lower third to happen. Oh, yeah. Um, how's it all I'm going? What's going on? What's happening? I, I'm deeply amused at how much darker you and I are getting week by week by week, although I seem to be more sunburned than you are. Oh, really? Yeah. I, uh, man, I love summer. <laughs> we're in the river. We're swimming. We're already swimming. We've we have, so so I have this river, this beautiful river that flows near my house, and we're in it all summer long. And this year, last year, we started taking the thermometer down so that we could figure out the temperature. And this year, we now started bringing the temperature early, like in the middle of April, to see what the yeah. temperature was. And so for us, we'll start swimming when it hits 15 degrees Celsius. Yeah, which sounds cold, but it's what we call that brisk. Um, <laughs> You know, above 18 degrees, it starts to get quite pleasant. But wow. below, below 18, it's pretty cold. Uh, but we'll still do it because it's so refreshing. We still love this river. And uh, But what's amazing is, you know, for my kids, this is a very scientific process. So we'll go down to the river, and we won't say, you know, you won't, like, look at it and go, oh, it looks a little cold. I don't know. We just, like, check the temperature. If it's above 15, we go swimming. And because uh, the amount of like water flowing on the river, depending on how much it's yeah. going past, melt. will change the temperature. Yeah, if it's snow melt, all this stuff changes the temperature. Yeah. And so, so it may look like it's warm, but it's actually cold. And it may look like it's cold, but it's actually warm. And so, anyway, so I love the. I lo how I love does summer. water look warm or cold? Just like if there's sun shining on it, you know, and then you're like, oh, it's so warm. It'd be nice. That's total survey. That that's total observer bias. That's why we use a thermometer now. <laughs> we know to the decimal. <laughs> So it's pretty hilarious. So my kids are like, 17.7! It's awesome! Let's go! So anyway, if you are wondering what on earth you've stumbled into, this is uh, Astronomy Cast. It's our penultimate before summer hi hiatus. That's right. So we are going to be recording uh, this episode today, and then we're recording another episode on Monday. And then we are going to take a break for the summer. And same goes for the Weekly Space Hangout. So we'll be doing, we'll try to do a Weekly Space Hangout on Friday. I'll be in transit, arriving at an airport at 7 in the morning. So I will try to get set up and do the Hangout. Um, and I'll talk to Nicole about... Yeah, if we need to. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Um, and then next Friday, after that, we'll do an episode. And then um, we're going to not broadcast until September. So we'll be returning with a bang uh, for Con. the Dragon Con live show. And we'll be doing that, I don't know, Labor Day weekend, whichever one of the times. I don't think we have our schedule yet. But if you are going to be at Dragon Con, we'd love to see you. We'll be there, both of us. Yes. And, and more. Uh, and we're going to use our summer to do awesome things. I know I'm going to be working on developing new citizen science projects for CosmoQuest and writing grants. And you are working for an awesome brand new company that's trying to save the world while I work above the atmosphere. <laughs> that's right, yeah. So so I have a new job, which I'll go, I'll, I'll say it again when we actually record the Astronomy Cast episode. But I'm working for a company called Hero X, which is an offshoot of the X Prize. So the X Prize is still the X Prize, you know, first rocket to reach. 100 kilometers altitude twice within two weeks um, and they've gone on to do the Google Lunar X Prize Challenge and there was an oil challenge and the tricorder challenge there's all these different challenges but they wanted to sort of see if they could create a model, a platform where anybody can make a challenge anybody can fund the challenge anybody can compete on the challenge and let the internet figure out if this is a viable way to solve problems. So they've picked me to be the person to build it and make it happen. So that's uh, that's interesting and hard. <laughs> but uh, it's it's really fun and I you know I think I have a good background to do this. So I know all about the X Prize and I have built a lot of software applications on the internet. So so hopefully I'll be able to do both. So that's uh, and that's going to keep me pretty busy. So that's actually you know my summer vacation will actually be me trying to help a startup get rolling. So, um, and you can see that at HeroX.com. So there we go. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of the blogging uh, on the blog.HeroX.com. So join cool. me over there. Uh, okay, cool. So let's get uh, let's get rolling. Are you ready? I, I think so. I hope so. You always find ways to surprise me no matter how many years. Well, I'm going to say hi to some people. I'm going to say hi to Thomas Traniker, Eric Charland, Bob Harkins, Guido Bibra, a man, I need a man to hug and kiss. No, wait, what? What? Uh, Nancy Gargano, <laughs> Anne 
And uh, yeah, so they're all there, and I'm going to say hi to them. Um, Amanda Hug and Kiss. It's from The Simpsons. Have you seen that? Yeah. I yeah. just didn't know if someone actually like claimed that Google Plus Somebody login. did that last week, actually. Somebody put in a name last week and trying to catch me on that. Um, yeah. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm ready to click record whenever you are. Okay. I'm going to apologize to Preston for sniffling through the episode. Okay. And I'm, I'm pressing tell... record. Okay. I'm also going to press record. Hi, Preston. I'm going to sniffle a lot. I have hay fever. I'm very sorry. You are awesome. What, what she's saying is, feel free to remove the sniffling. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, Astronomy Cast, episode 349, Mercury 7 Astronauts. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really well, and I've got a new job that I thought I would announce here publicly in Astronomy Cast and among all the other things to try and get some publicity. Um, we, get to, we, get to, <laughs> we get to shamelessly self-promote things we do from time to time. We do, and this is an awesome project. This is a pretty awesome job. Yeah, so, so I have joined a company called Hero X, and Hero X is a offshoot of the X Prize, so you know we've talked about the X Prize before. This is the prize created by Peter Diamandis to offer that awarded ten million dollars to the first uh, private spacecraft that reached hundred kilometers altitude twice. It was won by Scaled Composites, and they've gone on to come up with other X Prizes like the Tricorder X Prize and the Lunar X Prize, which I know you're doing some some work with. Yeah. So so what Hero X is is it is sort of Kickstarter meets XPRIZE. And so the question is, can we take what worked with the XPRIZE and put it on the internet and let anybody come up with an XPRIZE style challenge, an incentive challenge? Can anybody raise the funds and pledge money together to, to create a prize? And then can anybody come together and, and compete to win the challenge? And if it's possible, then we're going to figure out how to do it. And so I, I am the new development manager for PureOx, and so I'm the person who is going to be sort of creating the features and functionality of the platform and trying to figure out how to make this go. And uh, yeah, so so if you are a fan of me, um, please, I beg you, come help me out. Uh, come and help, help us make some challenges. Try and figure out some ideas like the X Prize, like the Tricorder X Prize, like the Lunar X Prize. What are some ideas that would benefit humanity or just make everyone's lives a little easier? And uh, let's see if we can turn these into challenges and try and get them funded. So, so that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, so it's HeroX.com. And now back to our regular show. <laughs> um, uh, it's a total honor. I mean, Peter Diamandis. I'm a huge fan of Peter Diamandis and the X Prize, and and all the folks that have been working on this. So it's it's kind of a dream come true to work on this project. I want to see this succeed. So yeah, please me too. Go me too. support what he's doing. That'd be awesome. All right. So before the Apollo program, there was the Gemini, Gemini program, and before the Gemini came the Mercury program. Seven elite astronauts chosen from a pool of military test pilots. So how did NASA choose these original seven men? And so I guess this is a continuation of our of our numerology uh, <laughs> um, in which we uh, we look at things that have numbers in them. That is so, true. Yeah. So what is the? Uh, oh no. What? What? I'm using the wrong mic. Hold on one second. Oh, okay. We need to start over? I don't know if we need to start over. Hold on. Okay. Should I pause? No. Okay. Sorry, Preston. We Sorry. adore you, Preston. We just torture you sometimes. Um, okay, let's continue. Okay. okay. Um, right, okay, so. Sorry, Preston. Apologize. We'll figure that out. Um... Okay, so what was your <laughs> so so then who were the Mercury Seven? The Mercury Seven were test pilots. Uh, 
initially there had been a NASA plan to do open competition for the first astronauts, but the president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, came out and said no. It's 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 not just anybody we want. We want the best. We want test pilots. Um, amusingly, they didn't want Chuck Yeager, but that's a different story that we're not going into today. And and so the first place you look when you want test pilots back then was the military. And so then they looked at the military, which is full of tall, manly men who fly space not spacecraft, fly aircraft doing amazing things. And they realized the Mercury spacecraft is kind of tiny. So then they add, okay, you need to be a test pilot. You need to be under five foot eleven and you need to weigh less than 180 pounds. So that suddenly changes your demographic because if you think about it, five foot eleven on 180 pounds is pretty thin. I'm out. Yeah, and and well, are you taller than five foot eleven? Yeah. 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 So so I it it was you now are down to tiny test pilots and so then they said okay have to be under age 40 which gets us out again out. <laughs> you have to have the, a bachelor's degree or equivalent uh, so that one wasn't quite so bad so given out. everything well okay fine you weren't allowed to be an astronaut All right. um, 1500 hours flight time and qualified to fly jets finally something I can do yes so um, they put out an advertisement and got hundreds and hundreds of applicants, which kind of leaves you going, how, how do we deal with this? This is a lot of people. Um, so then they start searching military records because it wasn't just the application that mattered. So yeah, you had to write a coherent application, but then they looked at what was your service, where did you serve, how did you serve. And I'm kind of intrigued that they, they tried really hard to grab people from all the services. So even the Marines, which wasn't known for its test pilots, had five candidates. You had 47 coming in from the Navy, 58 coming in from the Air Force, um, 69 of these came to Washington, D.C. And they brought them in two groups, or at least they planned to bring them in two groups, except the first group was so good that they kind of stopped. So then they tortured them. Uh, I'm intrigued. <laughs> how, did they, how did they torture them? Um, so back then we had no idea what the human body would experience with weightlessness. We didn't know if people would be able to swallow in space. We, uh, we didn't know anything basically. We knew that people were going to be experiencing high g-forces and and so they did everything from uh, spinning them in centrifuges to doing uh, cold extreme tests by plunging their feet into ice water. They emptied them out in rather horrible medical ways using a grandmother torture device of enemas and castor oil. Um, and, and so they did all sorts of stuff and this was on top of the how athletic are you let's stick you on a treadmill forever and re and do oxygen readings and let's tilt you and leave you slanted for a long period of time and see how you respond to that so test after test after test after test it must have sucked like all of those blood tests like blood tests like every couple of days um, and, and yeah, and all of the other stuff they had to do. Yeah, no thank you. I'm out. And, and if you look at the timing for this, a lot of these were men who flew in World War II, who they'd been there, done that, hadn't always seen the best of conditions. And what really got me was looking at all the reasons that people originally got weeded out. So six somehow snuck in and turned out to be too tall. So that's the, oh, I didn't know I was that height problem. That one's fairly dignified at least. But then 33 just failed to be able to pass all of the exams. So this was rigorous, grueling, physiological testing that took place. And of those that survived at four were like, I'm done, I'm out of here, drop the mic, walk out of the room. And, yeah. and <laughs> just weren't going to keep going. 
Um, in the second round of testing they did of these poor individuals, um, eight more people didn't make it through all of the exams. And um, so after all the exams were over, they had 18 people to interview to basically do the media test, the education test, the IQ test. And they, from those 18, weeded it down to seven men, six of whom eventually flew into space on the Gemini program. And all of them were genius level IQ. All of them were Eagle Scouts, which I find the most amusing. And they were drawn from all of the different militaries. So we started out with one chimp and seven humans ready to fly into space. And the chimp and six humans were able to actually go up during uh, Mercury. That last human eventually flew during the Apollo Soyuz mission. And most of them flew more than once. But I think I'm jumping ahead of the story. So who then were, were these people? So they, they were a variety of different military men. Um, as I said, they were drawn from all the different militaries. So we had three Air Force pilots, Gus Grish Grissom, Cooper, Deakey Slayton. Um, there, there were three Navy pilots, Alan Shepard, Scott Carpenter, Shira. There uh, was one Marine Corps pilot, John Glenn. Um, it's kind of awesome given how few Marines started out in the testing that one Marine made it all the way through. I think that says something for Marines. Um, and and so the, these different men then proceeded to start training. and. This was something where their wives were front and center, they were front and center, they ended up um, signing an agreement with Life Magazine to have their life totally followed. Um, and they realized what they were in for, but they also realized the opportunity they were being given. And so they pulled together the wives supporting each other, they split all of the money from the media opportunities, um, they took care of each other for all the years of all of the missions and unfortunately we're at the point today where the only one left alive to still tell his story is, is John Glenn but for a lot of years many of these men rose through the different ranks of, of NASA and in cases like John Glenn's even through the US government. Yeah, I mean, Gus Grissom, of course, uh, lost his life during the Apollo One fire. Right. But the but the rest of them went on to move through the from the Mercury program, many of them into the Gemini program, and even into yeah. the Apollo program, right? Yes. So so Alan Shepard's the one that we all think about in terms of first American in space. Uh, this this is an interesting series, the Project Mercury, because. Um, while it had a whole lot of American firsts, it didn't actually do anything that hadn't already been done. Um, so we were still chasing on the heels of the Soviet Union at this point. So, of course, Ham the Chimp, who um, was a Project Mercury crew member, wasn't exactly one of the Mercury 7, but he did fly on the Mercury, and there were seven crewed Mercury missions, just one of them was crewed by chimpanzee. One was chimp crude, yeah. Yes, one was chimp crude. So so we start with uh, Ham the chimp who was trained to move levers in space because there was a whole lot of concern that um, the poor fellow uh, and poor humans later just wouldn't be able to, to think, to act, to do any... We, we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, so he launched uh, on what was called MR2 on January 31st, 1961. Um, it was a suborbital flight and he happily moved his levers and uh, his timing while he was going around the planet was only slightly slower, just like a second or so than it was when he was on the ground. And well, if a chimp can deal with the chaos of, of suborbital flight and still do his tasks, it's it's pretty easy to imagine that a uh, American military man who can fly test planes will be able to handle his controls. So we went from Ham the Chimp to then Alan Shepard. Um, he went up, uh, first launch for him um, was 
Unfortunately, his first launch and last launch for many, many years. Alan Shepard, um, a lot of people know the story of how he was waiting for launch, waiting for launch, and before launch he drank a whole lot of coffee, drank way too much coffee. Right. And they, they hadn't thought through the fact that he was going to get loaded up and they might not just kind of immediately take off. And they didn't. And so he eventually got permission to relieve himself of all of that coffee in his spacesuit. And one of the legends that's floating around, which isn't true, is that um, the reason he got grounded for so many years was because the urine uh, in his spacesuit when he hit zero G got into his ears and caused ear problems that then grounded him. Um, well, I haven't heard anyone correct the notion that um, he did get pee in his ears. Um, the The real reason that he got grounded was he had a condition called um, Meniere's disease, which is an e ear disorder, but it's it's not something that gets necessarily caused by pee in your ears. Right. Um, so he got grounded for the rest of the Mercury flights. He was chief astronaut throughout the Gemini years. And um, they finally cleared him again to launch during the Apollo missions. And he was the commander of the Apollo 14 crew. So he got to go back and forth from launching May 5th, 1961 on Freedom 7, a uh, 15-minute suborbital where he spent a whole lot longer waiting to launch. Um, then came down, took care of the other guys. He was that leader through the Gemini years, and then ev eventually finally got to fly again. Um, so he, unfortunately, he has passed away. He died in 1998 at the age of 74. Um, I personally find it greatly amusing that he lived out the rest of his life in Pebble Beach, which always makes me think of uh, I Dream of Jeannie. Um, so you do have the astronauts down there. And uh, he's another New Englander like I am. He, he's originally from Derry, New Hampshire. And these early astronauts, they did kind of come from all over the United States. So that was the, but that was, you know, that was a response to, um, I guess, to Yuri Gagarin. And they didn't actually, he didn't get a chance to actually orbit. It was a suborbital flight. It was a, you know, it was a ballistic trajectory that he took so it was still a little while before the Americans finally got someone to fully orbit the orbit. Yeah, the yeah. Even Bruce didn't do it after after Shepard. They they were still launching on Redstone missiles, and I use the word missile on purpose. They called them rockets. They were missiles. So these these weren't designed to go around the planet. These were designed to take out the Russians. And so Gus Grissom went up on Liberty Bell 7 in July of 1961, basically trying to do a quick turnaround, show what we're capable of. But while he went a little bit further, it was still a suborbital flight and just basically went up and down range and back down and rescued out of the ocean. Um, of course, the sort of surprising thing about that mission, as you say, you know, rescued out of the ocean, was was yeah. his spacecraft. The hatch blew open and water filled up, and it it sank. And we and, actually and only just recovered it. By we, I mean NASA, <laughs> um, uh, just a few years ago. And and it was it, the recovery was paid for privately. And I think one of the reasons that people paid to recover it is. Gus Grissom's career really got tarnished um, by rumor mongers after that who claimed that he panicked and he blew the door and yeah. there were people who said that there was no evidence of why the door would have blown on its own and um, these, these aren't exactly cheap spacecraft. This is why so many of them landed in museums afterwards and um, <sighs> Even after we rescued it, there was no clear evidence of why the hatch blew. So this is one of those mysteries that's just going to keep going and going and going. But um, 
he did get to go up again during the Gemini mission when Alan Shepard got grounded. Uh, Gus Grissom got swapped in to replace him on Gemini 3. So this time he, he got to do a um, multiple person launch. And since he was one of the tiniest astronauts, it was actually convenient to throw him on the itty bitty little tiny Gemini spacecraft. Um, so there was that. Um, but then, unfortunately, he died during the Apollo 1 testing, so he didn't even get to launch again. And that was just a horrific story that um, perhaps needs to be an episode of its own. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's this unfortunate clustering of disasters that happened all around the same time. There's Apollo 1, there's the Challenger, and the Columbia, and they all happened within, you know, roughly the same Days. part of... Yeah, within days of each other. Uh, yeah, early February, late January, early February. So, um, Right, so the next up then was uh, Glenn, John Glenn, and he went all the way around the Earth finally, and I guess that's because they upgraded his, his uh, rocket to a real yes. rocket. Yes, he, he finally got a, a real, complete Atlas rocket to launch on. Um, I feel comfortable calling it a rocket. It was not designed to bomb the Soviets. Um, and... Um, so he, he took off, he orbited the planet, he came back down, and then because he was really um, kind of one of the most talkative, most um, outgoing of these early astronauts, he didn't end up flying again, but he did end up, well, at least not yeah, on the, space the early ship, mission. Yeah, yeah. He, he many, many, many years later, he went up in 98 when he was a congressman. Um, but he took more of a backseat role and became a spokesperson for the astronaut corps, retired and went into politics and was a senator from Ohio for many years. I, I actually got to meet him when he was still a senator uh, back in 1996, and that was pretty awesome. Um, that's one of my highlights. But he... That was just kind of cool. He got to circle the globe, came back down safe, and um, sadly, after that, people kind of stopped remembering that these are still like all firsts um, in terms of what was able to happen. So you have Scott Carpenter, um, who again was someone who only got to go up once. Um, he went up on the Aurora 7. All of these early Mercury missions had seven this, seven that. That was too, uh, though, because there were seven astronauts, right? And they yeah. Put that number at the end just to sort of celebrate the, the team. Yes, and what was awesome about Carpenters, he went on to do oceanic research. So even though all of these men were... Um, hired because they were excellent test pilots. He was someone who went on to have a, a separate career where um, he kept the science front and center and that was kind of awesome. Um, so, yeah, he was... <laughs> right. <laughs> he, spent, he spent five hours in space. Kind of now, cool. one thing as well was that Carpenter replaced Deke Slayton, who, who had to step out. Yeah, and that was one of the, the great sorrows, is Deke Slayton, um, somehow they missed that he had a heart murmur. So with all the testing and everything else they did, it wasn't until partway through the program that they caught on, oh no, this guy has a heart murmur, we don't know how rigorous space is going to be, um, so they grounded him for the entirety of what was left of the Mercury program, grounded him for the entirety of the Gemini program, uh, grounded him for the part of the Apollo program that went to the moon and was sexy and exciting. And um, while he did a lot of good work, he, he was uh, one of the NASA directors for the astronaut corps. Um, it wasn't until the Apollo Soyuz missions, the the docking missions between the Apollo sp spacecraft and the Soyuz spacecraft, that he finally got to go into space. Um, so he retired in '82 and worked for commercial space agency in until he passed away. And um, so we're hitting the point where they're all slowly yeah. disappearing. 
hearing, so he died at, at age 69 in 1993. Uh, next up, Sigma 7 with uh, Shira. So we have Wally Shira, whose last name I have to admit, I struggle to remember. Um, so he, his, his flight is sometimes cast classified as the one that went the most the way it was supposed to, which I find a fascinating way to describe a mission. Uh, so he went up, he was in space for 9 hours and 13 minutes and 11 seconds, and he ate and he drank and he orbited and he orbited some more and he came back and no one remembers him. But this is where they were starting to you know, work on these incremental developments, yeah. right? They, yeah. you know, the first one with with Shepard and Grissom, they were only up for 15 minutes. They didn't even do a full yeah. orbit. They then for Glenn and Carpenter, they were up for three orbits. They were up for four hours, and then with Shira, he was there for nine hours, and he did six yes. full orbits of the of the Earth, and then and then after that with Cooper, it was it was 22 orbits. And yeah, so so day. sure. And Shira had a kind of awesome career, even if he does have the name no one remembers. Um, he got to go back up during Gemini 6. Uh, he was assigned to command an Apollo mission. Um, un unfortunately, um, because of the catastrophe with Apollo 1, um, he ended up getting um, promoted to the first manned flight Apollo 7, um, and there was just chaos with, with a lot of his career, but he did end up going up with Apollo 7, and Shira was the one and only one to fly Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. So that's, that's kind of neat. Uh, yeah, and so that was the last, uh, the last mission was, was Cooper's, and uh, he, I think he was the last surviving astronaut of that group as well, right? Well, John Glenn's still alive. Well, except for John Glenn, yeah, of course. Yeah. He's like, his last one. He yeah. Passed in 2004. In, uh, no, Sherry died in 2007. No, I was talking about Cooper, Gordon Cooper. Oh, right, right, yeah. yeah. So, so skipping ahead to, to Gordon Cooper, um, another man who orbited for nine hours. Um, and... Uh, so he flew up on Faith 7, uh, which was May 1963. So he was into the second year of launching Americans into space. He was on um, just another, let's go up, let's orbit the planet. Um, but he's known as the first man to sleep in space. And I honestly don't know how... When you're only going to be in space for nine hours, you calm down enough. Well, I'm seeing that he was there for a day and ten hours. One day and ten hours, twenty-two orbits. So. Okay, I I apparently found bad information. So maybe that's how we did it. Things okay, that would make a whole lot more sense. You're yeah, right. Thirty-four hours, nineteen yeah. minutes, forty-nine seconds. You're right. Okay, bad link. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, he was the first human to sleep in space, and even at 34 hours, it's just There's no like, way. I'd be too jazzed. There's no way I'd yeah. be sleeping. Yeah. Heck, we do hang out a thons that long. Um, so he's the person who uh, is responsible for the phrase spam in a can, referring to being trapped in one of these things. Um and uh, he, again, he was part of Gemini 5. Uh, he commanded Gemini 5. And from there, he went on to corporate world. Um, he did end up dying um, of heart failure, and he developed Parkinson's disease. So it's kind of how human these people were, even though we tout them up as superheroes. These were just people who had amazing brains and amazing flight skills, um, but they were still human. Um, unfortunately, for better or worse, Gordon Cooper is also known for his UFO experiences. Right. Um, but I think we're just going to kind of brush right on past that one, maybe. Right. So those were the, uh, I mean, those were the manned and chimped um, 
Those uh, were the Mercury, crude. The crude Mercury missions. There's actually a whole bunch more unmanned ones, and a lot of like those classic rockets exploding, rockets going up and then coming back down. You know that all happened. I think one number that I, that sort of jumped out at me that's quite amazing was the budget uh, was 1.73 billion in inflation adjusted dollars. Yeah. So, so that's you know today's money, which is kind of a, a which kind of amazing that they did all that. That's less than the cost of James Webb, I think. Mm hmm And it involved the work of two million people. So, yeah. um, unless I'm getting the 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 numbers wrong, but it just shows that you know w there was a time when NASA was very agile and could and could get these missions going and get uh, and get step by step advancements moving from to send humans into space. So, yeah. Um, and now, reference material. I think there's some really wonderful, wonderful reference material that people can go if they want to follow the story a little further. Uh, the, there's sort of two things that I love, and you know maybe you'll have some others. So the one is from the Earth to the Moon, which is based on the uh, Andy Chaikin series book, and then they made this TV show called From the Earth to the Moon, and it was, I think, directed and produced by Tom Hanks, and uh, it was on HBO. And yes. And they cover mini series. Yeah, and so they cover like I think one episode or two episodes with the Mercury folks, and then on to the Gemini's and on to the Apollos. Just wonderful. Um, and then the actual book itself, from the Earth to the Moon. And then the other one, of course, is the Right Stuff, which is also a movie. And uh, and and it goes in. It goes into the whole thing that we skipped over, which was the whole why isn't Chuck Yeager one of these? Yeah, but it just goes into the personalities of the astronauts and and uh, just covers it with sort of humor and wit and and really great. So either the movie or the book, uh, definitely or both. Goes up. Or both, yeah, yeah. But if you want to like have a full understanding of of that time, you know, if you want, if you read from the Earth to the Moon um, and write stuff, you'll uh, you'll have a really good uh, understanding of it. And, and it's really amazing to compare what they looked for then with what they look for today because now they're looking at interdisciplinary degrees, fluency in Russian, you need to be medical trained, you need to be flight trained, you need, and, and they've just upped the ante so much. You no longer need to be a military test pilot, but in some ways I think that was easier because at least you knew where the bar was. Yeah. I, I don't know if I could be an astronaut now. Probably, you know, because they, they will let, like, regular schmoes come on board if they have some specific skill they need. So, yeah. so maybe they specialist. need a podcaster for their uh, next mission. All right, well, thank you very much, Pamela, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Sounds great. I'll see you next week. Okay, don't go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Not you. M. <laughs> I have a dog that decided to come in. Um, okay. Oh, the cat wants to be let upstairs. That oh, was an amazing out. meow. Yeah, she's figured it out. She's all right. <laughs> um, okay. 349. And feel free to get your questions ready. Go to the Q&A app if you haven't already and queue up some questions that we can uh, throw at Pamela. This always frightens me the way you phrase it. That's awesome. What the... Where's my Dropbox? Hmm. Okay, I'll have to find my Dropbox. I don't know how you lose that. I don't know either. Today is going to be our first day over 30. Temperature-wise? Yep. It's not right. Well, I'm going to Louisiana, <laughs> and it just sounds awful. Like, who lives in, who lives like that in that kind of, you know... High temperatures, and high humidity, and lots of mosquitoes. I don't. I don't. And get Louisiana it. has red dirt. And red ants. They have these. They have fire oh, ants. Oh yeah, those are evil. Yeah, I I deserve whatever 
horrible biting I get because I've messed with so many red ant nests. <laughs> All right, so let's get rolling now. So uh, Guido Bieber says, uh, Summer hiatus equals time to explore the archives. There are literally hundreds of previous AC, Weeks of Space Hangout, Virtual Star Parties on YouTube. Absolutely. You could, plus all the stuff that's being posted to Astrosphere vids, all of the learning space, the Lunar X Prize hangouts. Yeah. Are we'll you not plenty of, We will have plenty of content, and I'm going to work on doing more uh, space story recordings and uh, a whole bunch more stuff. And I am actually going to be doing a podcast via HeroX. So my, my plan is that I'm going to be interviewing people who are sort of at the cutting edge of various problems. So um, I'm going to interview people who are working on, like, you know, malaria and desalination and solar energy and, you know, interesting challenges like that. And just trying to get a sense of, like, where it stands right now and what are the big challenges that people are looking for and where do they need to have some advances in to maybe kind of get people's ideas rolling. So, um, uh, Tom Jovanov asks, uh, did the Mercury 7 request a window be installed in those early crafts so they could see the Earth? Have you heard that story? I can imagine, yes, I have. There was a talk at the American Astronomical Society a few years ago, and there was originally a plan not to have a window, and the astronauts kind of dug their heels in. There was also original plans that everything was going to be automated, and they kind of said no, just nope. Yep, yeah, we're flying these. Um... Joel Remy asks, just popped in, have one of you guys been in space? Nope. Nope. Okay, moving on. I've flown at 36,000 feet before. Really? Otherwise known as 747. <laughs> um, yeah. I think the, the closest we're going to get, um, yeah, is if we ever get a chance to fly on Spaceship One or Spaceship Two, right? Well, no, I, I don't think that's the case because you and I are, are basically 40-ish and I really think that within the next 40 years we're going to end up with transatlantic suborbital as kind of the thing. So before um, we die, we'll get a chance to fly a suborbital. So I think that like those late life, I'm retired, I'm going to go see the Eiffel Tower, which I actually still haven't done. Um, I, I can imagine that being a suborbital flight someday, the way it's uh, a 880 now, or whatever the code number for the Dreamliners are. Right, but I mean the suborbital. I mean, can you imagine the, you know, people going on these things that go up, they float weightless, and then they come back down. It would be terrifying. Like, it's possible. I think it would be absolutely terrifying. Um, Okay, uh, Bob Harkins wants to know, is the VSP also going on summer hiatus? So no, um, we're going to do a VSP uh, at the beginning of July and then we're going to do one at the beginning of August. So we're going to we're moving those to monthly. So we'll have more details about how that's all going to work coming out shortly. Um, let's see, what else we got? Thomas Tranecker asks, should I get an H-alpha or sodium telescope to observe the sun? H-alpha. H-alpha. Yeah, all those beautiful pictures you see of the sun with like, little prominences and granules and stuff on the surface, that's all H-alpha. Yeah, H-alpha. Um, uh, your favorite food is? Daniel Or Orietta Or wants to know what your favorite food is. Oh... My favorite comfort food is really spicy green. Um, spicy green, sorry, what? Curry? Curry, yeah. Curry, yeah. Like a really nice Indian curry on a kind of, I just want something to make me feel good kind of day. My favorite, like, I'm going to go spend more money than I should on food is a good... Everything from the ocean thrown in with tomatoes and pasta and spices. Right. Um, something that usually involves the word Diablo in it. Um, I like sushi. Yes. And I like 
um, Mexican food, although I probably, you know, I had like proper Tex-Mex down in Texas for the first time, I think hanging out with you actually, and it was just yeah. a revelation that, you know, our Canadian Tex-Mex is, is no good. No. No. No, and, and you need to go to Albuquerque. From, yeah, and it's different from Mexican food, which I've had as well. You know, it's a different thing. Um, you know, street tacos, things like that. Um, Ronald Minch says, I look forward to seeing Mr. Fraser in Atlanta Dragon Con. I've gone for over 25 years. Wow. How have That's you not sad. seen us yet? Yeah, we've been there year after year after year, but maybe you didn't recognize us because we weren't doing video back then as much. Well, and we hide on the podcasting panel sometimes. Um... Let's see. Sylvan Westby just finished watching From the Earth to the Moon, which I mentioned. So Cool. Good job. Um, Kevin Gill says, no surprise there, plus one Marines. <laughs> Kevin was a Marine. Is a Marine? I don't know. It's uh, still awesome statistically given how few airplanes, how few people yeah. made it in. It's just kind of statistics were not with them. Harold D. D Leon says, hello from the Dominican Republic. Awesome. Hello, Hello, Dominican Republic. Um, let's see, have I got anything else? I'm not seeing anyone over on Twitter. Let's see if I got anything over on Google Plus. <laughs> Lewis Hill says over on Google Plus that Fraser's cat meows and my cats go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have the best cat in the world. I have you do. I, I really have the greatest cat ever. I have a, uh, I have a Russian blue, a very expensive cat, um, but uh, it's a great cat and just, you know, doesn't doesn't want to use a litter box. Just comes and goes from the house. We don't ever clean up after her. All we do is every now and then refill her food bowl, and she's not. She's never scratched us. She's never. Um, she, she's not kind of uh, weird like cats can be. She's just. Gentle and peaceful and happy and but not super needy. It's perfect. And she's yeah. not a serial killer. No. Well, she murders a lot of birds and. Oh really? Mites. Yeah, yeah. A lot of death is brought <laughs> to our uh, in, into this house. And and it's important to point out you live someplace where it's safe for a cat to be outside. Well, we have cougars and raccoons, but uh, yeah. Um, John, you've had, like no street that cats can. The cat's going to run out and get hit easily. Um, uh, John Yeager on uh, Google Plus Ask May I ask a question about Hubble. If there's no way to refuel when the time comes, what will happen to it? Are there any plans to correct this problem? Um, refuel is kind of the wrong way to look at it. There's a whole lot of things that will go wrong. Gyroscopes are really the final death knell on any spacecraft. Um, I believe that during the last servicing mission, they installed um, essentially the ability to, to dock with it with a robotic spacecraft so they can lug it around as they want. But right now the plan once it's done able to do science or we run out of money is to retire her and um, this is because there's simply not enough money to maintain Hubble and continue to expand our observational fleet. We have W first coming on the heels of James Webb, so James Webb is hopefully going to launch in the next few years. Um, they're starting construction in 2016 of W first, which will be a new infrared telescope. And um, it's with Alma and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and Curiosity and the Mars uh, sample return mission that is planned. We just don't have the money. It's, it's getting to the point where we're having to fire the people who do the science because there's not enough money for salaries. We, we want to grow. We want to do more, but there's no money. And you're about to take me down the rabbit hole where Pamela no. gets depressed. No, let's not get depressed. Let's not depress Pamela about how there isn't a lot of funding. Um, Helg Bjorkhag says, uh, you can fly a MiG-29 to the edge of space. Uh, I'm sure that's possible. No, thank you. I wouldn't mind being a passenger, but I I'm not detail-oriented enough. No, I, I took I... ground school. I'm not going to learn how to fly a plane. I am not detail-oriented. No, it's, uh, that just sounds terrifying. Just <laughs> terrifying. 
But you want to go up on Spaceship 2. No, I just said that's how it would happen if it happened. No, all these things just sound just sound terrifying. I, I, I've, I've regaled people with this story before that I asked an astronaut what it was like to launch, you know, and this was early on in my days, and I was, you know, was, uh, it was Story Musgrave, and I was asking him, and I was like, and I, I don't know, I asked the dumbest question. I'm like, you know, was it, was it exciting to launch on the space shuttle? And he just said, no, no, it was not fun at all. You, you are in this rumbling terrifying ongoing explosion it's really uncomfortable and you're aware that that this machine has killed people in the past and really until you reach orbit and everything settles down you're not having a very good time yeah and and this is where i think i'd be okay with the ming cuz really that's a much more casual way to get to the top of the atmosphere um, and less okay with the whole controlled explosion part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, well, we're out of time. Let's wrap it up. So okay. thank you very much, Pamela. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, hopefully, as I said, we'll try and get... Sorry about the weekly space hangout last week, uh, but hopefully things will work out well on Friday, and, um, and then get ready to enjoy summer. We will. Sounds great. Yes, we right. will. We already are. We already are. All right, see you later, everyone. <laughs> Bye-bye.